Well, I'm excited to see you all here today. These are unsettled and difficult times, I don't need to tell you, but it is good to see so many friends. Old friends and new friends. Coming together to stand together at this time, it gives me a great sense of hope and a great sense of strength. We gather today under a banner that is new to many of us, the banner of national conservatism, and one may reasonably ask, what is national conservatism? What do we need it for? Why do we need it now? Like many of you, I joined the American conservative movement as a student, as a college student in the days when the Soviet Union was still seeking to overthrow the world, when Ronald Reagan was president, Margaret Thatcher was prime minister in the UK. As a high schooler, I read Commentary Magazine. As a high schooler, I played Ronald Reagan in a mock debate. <laughs> 35 years ago today in college, I was busy founding a Reaganite magazine on my college campus, the Princeton Tory, which is still publishing today. And in... <laughs> And in those days, I believed that I had a very clear understanding of what political conservatism was. I mean, I, I was, you know, 19 years old, but I believed I had a very clear understanding of what political conservatism was. The Tory was supported by Irving Kristol's Institute for Educational Affairs. And, and, and by the way, I'm extremely pleased to have the public interest Irving Kristol's magazine, which he founded as a sponsor uh, of, of this conference. But Irving Kristol, you know, there's a little bit of optical illusions here. Irving Kristol was known as the great neoconservative. And yet, the word neoconservative in those days didn't mean anything like what the word neoconservative means today. In fact, it almost meant the opposite. When we learn to be conservatives, under the aegis of Irving's institution, what we were learning was that modern conservatism was a movement that was founded on three pillars. This is Irving. Modern conservatism is founded on three pillars, religion, nationalism, and economic growth. And in Irving's view, religion of the three was the most important because it was only religion that could pro provide the framework for a decent life that would allow economic growth and nationalism to be kept in check and in balance. That was the, the old neoconservatism. That was the conservatism that I was brought into a long, long time ago before the word meant something entirely different. And I loved that American conservative movement in those days. And I felt these are people who think like I do, and this is my place. But something went terribly wrong with American conservatism after the fall of the Berlin Wall in November 1989, exactly 30 years ago. Within a year after this momentous event, American and British conservatism was awash with fantastic nonsense about the end of history having arrived. Within a year, the Tories had dumped Margaret Thatcher for insisting on British nationalism, on British national independence, and opposing the submersion of her nation into the European Union. Within a year, George H.W. Bush was speaking in utopian terms about a new world order in which the law of the jungle would be replaced by the rule of law everywhere on earth. A new world order. I remember those words as if it were yesterday. I first heard them on the radio. I remember the chill that raced down my spine. And I said, can this really be happening? I thought, isn't that exactly what the Americans fought World War II and the Cold War in order to avoid? Utopian thinking swept the political right in the United States and in the UK and in Europe. And we, we have to understand this. It ruined everything it touched. In 1992, these conservatives, in many cases, we, we should without flinching say former conservatives, they cheered the declaration of a European Union to erase the nationalities of Europe. 
1993, they enthusiastically greeted the Oslo Accords fueled by the fantasy of a new borderless Middle East. In 1997, they were all too happy to hand Hong Kong over to the Chinese and to bring China, the first step to bring China into the World Trade Organization in their breathless excitement over the imminent liberalization and democratization of China. For those of you who are too young to remember it, let me make the point simply. In the 1990s, the conservative movement was drunk with the feeling of power as a result of the victory over communism. And people who are drunk with power lose touch of reality. And these conservatives, in particular, forgot anything that they had ever known about how to conserve anything. They lost all interest in Edmund Burke and in traditionalism. They lost all interest in the details of the Anglo-American political inheritance, except for a few particular lines that they keep quoting over and over again as they were the, their, their universal dogma. But the, the, the span of the tradition, they lost interest in it. They lost interest in the Bible, in Christianity and Judaism. Neither nationalism nor religion had any hold on them any longer. All that interested them was economic liberalism and the rights of the free and equal individual. In other words, they became instead of conservatives, they became a revolutionary movement, declaring universal liberal empire to be the world historical purpose of the American nation since its founding, and they set out on a mission to uproot all opposition to it, whether abroad or at home. For a generation, we've watched as conservatives wasted their energies, their political capital, their financial resources, all this in addition to the lives of hundreds of thousands of servicemen and civilians, all this in the vain, prideful, foolish, and ultimately fatal conceit that their very own minds had unlocked the secret to bringing perpetual peace and prosperity to every corner of the earth. And now we live among the wreckage brought about by that fatal conceit. A generation later in America has with its own hands built up China as a genuine rival and a threat and a menace. A generation later in much of the Middle East has been set to torch by America's own hand, yet with nothing to show for it but humiliation. A generation later in America's industrial heartland has been shuttered and its factories closed and rusting. A generation later in the country has been flooded with porn and with drugs. A generation later in America's economic leadership has been given over to juvenile John Lennon clones who openly aspire to expend their corrupt, witless rule over all of mankind. A generation later in America has abandoned any thought of being able to balance its budget or to pay its debts. Hey, why not? They're young people in the room, let's stiff them with the bill. A generation later in America's borders, like the borders of Europe, have been effectively dissolved. A generation later in America's leaders and institutions of learning have determined that only Marxism and libertarianism are legitimate worldviews to teach and that no conservative scholar will ever be hired again to a tenured position. A generation later in Christianity, the force that did create this nation, is freely falling as it fell in Europe. A generation later, and this noxious brew of bad political philosophy, social disintegration, and surpassing arrogance is what American conservatives have been marketing to the rest of the world as something that the rest of the world should want to imitate and implement in their own countries too. And this is called conservatism. This is depressing. <laughs> It's been depressing to watch it unfold, but I want to tell you, today I feel good. I do. Today I feel good. I feel good, and I feel good because I know that today is our Independence Day. Today we declare independence from neoconservatism. 
we declare independence from neoliberalism, from libertarianism, from what they call classical liberalism. You, you can give it any name you want, but that set of ideas that sees the atomic individual, the free and equal individual, as the only thing that an educated person needs to know about politics, and if he or she knows the free and, in, the free and equal individual, then he or she has the ability to set out and rule the world, that worldview, we are declaring independence from it today. Now, we have at this conference almost 50 speakers, and we're not going to agree on many different things, not today and not into the future. We'll have many arguments, and they're going to be exciting. But the crucial thing is that there are things that unite everybody or almost everybody in this room. And what unites us is that we are national conservatives. All right, so which means to begin with that we're united in rejecting the idea that universal liberal empire can be or is the end and aim of conservatism. All right. That means that when we look to our left, we see people, we see people who see the world in terms of individualism, in terms of individ individuals. In other words, they see the world through the lens of the discipline of economics, right? When you, when you study economics in college, they teach you to see you know, the, the choosing individual, the free individual, the rational individual. Right? That's, that's the foundation of economics. And that political worldview, that libertarianism or neoconservatism to our left, what it essentially does is it in, it, it's the invasion of politics the invasion of thinking realistically about politics by economics. It seeks to reduce political phenomena to economic theory. Right? That's, that's what it does. That's that entire school that's dominated the Republican Party and a large part of, of the Democratic Party. All it wants to do is to reduce every political phenomenon to some kind of economic theory of the free, equal choosing individual. But the real political world does not consist of those atomic, free, choosing individuals. The real political world is one of competing tribes and nations. It's the real existence of tribes and nations that generates political phenomena such as national borders, independent national governments, national traditions, national cohesion, and national dissolution. Imagine if you see the world through that libertarian lens, through that economic, economistic lens, you cannot understand what a border is for. You can't see cohesion and disillusion. You can't see nations. You're completely blind to the central political phenomena that are taking place in the world. That, that is, in fact, the clash between the, the elites and the broad public, is that the broad public has a traditional view of what the political world looks like, and they listen to the elites who have been trained in university and say, you're completely blind. You don't see anything. Without a clear awareness of what these things are, these truly empirical political phenomena, phenomena your political program is going to be plagued with blindness to political reality. And I think that that's exactly what we've seen for 30 years. That our leaders trying to reduce, struggling to reduce, unable to see nations, their cohesion and their dissolution, unable to see tribes, unable to see the reality of real political things, living in a fantasy world in, every, in which everyone is an atomic choosing individual, rational, they create one blunder after another, one idiotic policy after another, because they don't know what human beings are. They don't, they're not interested in learning about reality. Now, I've, I'm describing what's to our left. Let me talk for a moment about what's to our right. There is something to our right, and I don't want to underestimate it. I, 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 many friends of mine in the conservative movement like to say, white nationalists, that's a, just a tiny periphery. Okay, and it is. It is still a tiny periphery. But, you're not, but, but if you think it's just a tiny periphery, you're looking in the wrong place. If you look at the young people, look at people in their 20s and 30s, look at people online, look at people, look at, 
Look at, look at those kids. What are they reading? What are they talking about? Who are they watching? And I'm telling you that there is a very powerful movement in this country and in other countries that says this universal liberalism is completely detached from reality and they seek reality in the lessons of, 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 of population genetics and, uh, and, and evolutionary biology which is being applied systematically by scholars, right? Both real scholars at, at, at Harvard and other institutions who are studying these things and all sorts of bogus scholars online. But, the, but, but they, they have their expertise, their ex encyclopedic knowledge, their worldview that they are building, which many young people are buying, whose influence grows rapidly with every single day and this is a view that says that the reality is not the atomic individual who freely chooses. The reality is the reality of genetics and race, which determines all. Now, it is scary to hear that such a thing has planted itself in the United States. God willing, it will stay small. But at the moment, it's not staying small. At the moment, it's growing quickly. Okay, and this, this insanity is actually kind of a mirror image of the insanity of the libertarians. Because just as the libertarians want to take economic theory, which is perfectly useful in its own sphere, and invade politics and turn politics into economics, these people want to take genetics and, and biology and invade politics and have biology take over politics turning all of us into robots that are, that are controlled by, by our birth and by our race and by our genes. Now, both of these are apolitical. I mean, they, they get involved in politics, but they, they, they create fantasy worlds. Both of these theories refuse to pay attention, refuse to attend to the reality. What's the reality? The reality is that human beings there's an autonomous political realm in which human beings live. And the number one factor, the number one thing to be considered about that realm is that human beings are sticky, sticky, that we stick, that we form into families and clans and tribes and nations and families of nations and churches and schools and all sorts of other institutions. The, the race theorists would have us believe it's all determined by birth, but it isn't all determined by birth. Just look, just, just, if, if you've served in the army, if, you, if you've been in the service, you know that you join a platoon and no one in the platoon was born together with you. Right? There's no genetic commonality among the men who serve in the platoon, but they come under fire, they come under duress, and there is no one there is no one who is closer to you, who establishes ties of mutual loyal, loyalty, bonds that last the rest of your life, than someone who is protecting your back when you were on the battlefield. Right? But you don't even need to be on the battlefield to see that human beings don't only stick to, gen to people of their genetic kind. It's absurd. Human beings, I know human beings who stick I, I know someone who wouldn't come across, the, who wouldn't come to this conference because he's loyal to a pair of puppies that he rescued from, from, from I, the horrors of, of, of puppydom. And, <laughs> and, he ha and this is a serious guy. And, and he's babysitting the puppies in Dallas right now. Okay, now I, it, it's funny, but I don't mean to make fun of him. Human beings, the, human beings have this cracked ability to develop mutual loyalty with dogs and with horses. And you can't tell me that that's fake, and you can't tell me that, it, that, that it's because of the genetic proximity of this individual and his two puppies. <laughs> okay, now, it, we have a genetic inheritance and we have a cultural inheritance. And that cultural inheritance allows us, under different circumstances, to merge and to join and to bring together and to adopt. Families can adopt. 
clans can adopt, tribes can adopt, nations can adopt. We've seen it countless times in history. So if it's not the freely choosing individual that creates nations, and if not genetics, then what creates nations? Well, there is this one thing that creates nations, this one thing that we need to focus on, although they don't teach it in political theory in university. All right, and that is the ties of mutual loyalty that human beings create, the bonds of mutual loyalty that are what allow us to sacrifice for one another, to serve one another, to serve together, to serve causes greater to, than ourselves, and even to sacrifice our lives. It's these bonds of mutual loyalty. And a nation is, as was said, it was, a nation is that kind of love. It is these bonds of mutual loyalty. Now, if we're gonna talk about a politics that is focused not on the individual and not on race, but on the nation, right? And that's what we're doing here. That is what we're doing here. We're creating a space in which the individual will continue to be very important and race will continue to have some kind of relevance, but the central question in politics is going to return to be as it used to be a generation ago, is going to return to be the idea of the nation, as Rusty said, this is, an, and th this is the way that the Bible thinks about politics, is in terms of na nations. If we're going to return to the idea of a nation, we need to return, in fact, to three principles. First, national independence. Second, national cohesion. And third, national traditions. National independence is the principle that says the world is governed best when the world is divided up among many different nations. They have borders among, they're divided by borders, and each one has within its border, borders its own laws, it, its own traditions, its own way of doing things, and it leaves the others alone. Now, that's not a utopia. We're not going to be able to implement tomorrow. It's not a blueprint. It's a hope. But it can also be a guiding principle for us to, to orient ourselves, to understand what our politics is about. If every nation has its own way of doing things, its own traditions and its own laws, so we, our job is not to be the world's policemen. Our job is not to teach the Afghanis how to run their country. If they want to come and visit our country and learn from us, then, then of course we can be a light unto the nations. Come, come learn from us. That's the, that's the ancient biblical vision of Israel. Right? God, God gives Israel the Torah, and the Torah is supposed to be for, for all the nations of the world, but God then gives Israel borders. He doesn't say, go out and conquer all the nations of the world. He says, you stay behind your borders, and when they're ready, they'll come. Right? That's the ideal of national independence, that our people wants to determine, we want to determine our fate. We want others to leave us alone and we'll leave them alone. Not because we don't care, but because that's the best way to care. Let us develop our experiment. Let us develop our ways. If we are right that our ways are the best, others will imitate us. And if we fail and if we're wrong, let us fail as a free people and then we'll imitate others in order to fix things. That's the principle of national independence. The second principle of national cohesion. Now I know Chris mentioned that, that, or, or, earlier that, that there's some interpretations of this, this word that are a little bit scary. I'm using this word the way that it's used by the philosophers John Stuart Mill and Henry Sidgwick. All right, these, I mean, you can wave these names around with, with liberals. They're, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that they're at the farthest possible right of academia today, John Stuart Mill, but, but you can still use them. They're still, they're still permissible for, for at least another few more years. And, and, and when, when, when Mill talks about cohesion, he's talking about this mutual loyalty that we talked about before. He's, he's observing an empirical fact Nations come together and feel unity. They feel unity and, and, and mutual loyalty and an ability to rise up uh, against challenges. They feel that, it's real. It allows them to do incredible things, like, for example, having a democracy. Only a cohesive country can have a democracy. Why? Because if the country isn't 
isn't strongly mutual loyal, mutually loyal, if it's not strongly cohesive, then when one side wins the election, then the other side will refuse to hand power to them. They'll have a resistance. They'll fight them. They'll say they're illegitimate. They'll say, well, we didn't mean that when we said, you know, democracy. Right? We meant, we meant more people like us would take over. That's democracy. If you don't have cohesion, you will not have democracy because no one's going to hand power to anybody else. Right? So clocking, paying attention to what causes cohesion, what brings it about, and where is it fraying? And I have to tell you that in my life, I've never seen the cohesion of America as frayed as it is today. So you can't, you can't tell me cohesion isn't a real thing. Because if fraying is a real thing, then fraying is the opposite of cohesion. It's, it's America falling apart. If it goes far enough, then there won't be changes of power democratically anymore. If it goes far apart, far enough, God forbid, then there'll be civil war. So cohesion is the most important thing to be thinking about right now. And so when we come to look at a policy like immigration, right? I, I'm not that interested. I mean, I understand that there are economic arguments and there are good, interesting economic arguments about, uh, about who should be, how, how many new immigrants there should be. But honestly, it doesn't make a darn bit of difference what the economic arguments are if the country is fraying so badly, if the cohesion is so shot that adding more immigrants is going to literally tear the country to pieces. So stop. So stop, have, have some common sense. First things first, you can't give away your national independence and you can't give away your national cohesion. You have to care for those things. You don't care for those things, then you won't have any rights and you won't have any freedoms and you won't have anything that's good for you and you also won't have economic success. The third principle as nationalists that we should be concerned with after national independence and national cohesion, the third principle is national traditions. Okay, and tradition, tradition is a word that has, has almost evaporated from the American lexicon along with honor, along with sanctity, and along with God and scripture. I mean, these, are, these are things that, that two generations ago, they still were thick in the United States, and one generation ago, they still had some kind of presence, and now they've been stuffed into private corners of, of, of America where people bring them out because other people aren't looking. All right, and I, I, I can't tell you what a catastrophe this is, because a nation has to have things that hold it together, right? I, I described the psychological mechanism of mutual loyalty. Right, of national cohesion. But you can't have cohesion over nothing. You, you have to have cohesion over something shared. It, not, it doesn't have to be a particular document or a particular philosophy. It's a tradition of things, a tradition of arguments that are our arguments, not somebody else's arguments. Okay, and America it has been in the business now for, for three generations of uprooting every, every traditional concept that has made this country recognizable, would have to our ancestors and to our parents. I'm talking about, I'm talking about God and scripture. I'm talking about nation and family. I'm talking about man and woman. I'm talking about the sacred and the honorable. Every single one of these keystone concepts that held this nation together has come under attack, has, has been severely damaged, and in many cases overthrown. Okay, so I'm gonna say something that I know that for many people is not the easiest thing to hear. In the 1960s, many conservatives went along with the idea that you could privatize religion. They thought you could just take God and scripture and put them in, in the private sphere and it would be fine because we have innate, natural, universal reason which would allow us to continue to defend the family and the nation and its borders and reasonable immigration rates and the ability to pay back our, 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 our national debt and, 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 and on and on. We, we thought you could just stay reasonable having gotten rid of God and scripture. And guess what? There's no shred of truth in this at all. We tried it. We did it. 
It turns out that it was God in scripture that was holding in place the entire set of structures, not reason, tradition. You throw out Christianity and, 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 and the Jewish contribution to with it, but basically in this country, Christianity, you throw out Christianity, you throw out the Torah, you throw out God, and within two generations, people can't tell the difference between a man and a woman. They can't. <laughs> they can't tell the difference between a foreigner and a citizen. They can't tell the difference between this side of the border and the other side of the border. They, they can't tell the difference between paying back your debts and, and simply borrowing forever. It doesn't matter. The, all these things are the same. It sloshes back and forth. The, the, the political fads, they come and they go with no anchor, with nothing to anchor them. Right? And the only way, if there is a way, the only way to save this country, to bring it back to cohesion, to bring it back to independence and health, the only way to do it is going to be to, to restore those traditions. Okay, so I understand so that many people, many people were raised atheists. It's not simple. But let's start with this. If you're not giving honor to the traditions of your grandparents and your great-grandparents, if you're not giving honor to God and scripture, if you're not giving honor to those traditions, you have simply thrown the anchor away. And when somebody comes and tells you, you know, I just think that the world is going to be better off if America is ruled from Brussels. So it sounds funny now. It's not funny. That's what they teach in the universities. There has to be a return to national tradition, to the traditions of this nation. These are Anglo-American traditions of constitutionalism, the common law, the English language, and the Christian religion with a specific emphasis in England and America on the Old Testament. These are things, these are the traditional cultural inheritance of this people. These, these are the things around which unity and cohesion amid diversity was possible. E pluribus unum, the creation of unity out of diversity was possible because of those things, English language, the common law and Anglo-American constitutional tradition, and scripture, Christian scripture. Those are the things. Now, it is a very steep climb to bring them back. Maybe it's impossible to do, but it doesn't change the fact that we need to know which way to go. We need to have a direction and to know what that direction is. National conservatism is a direction for this country and for the UK and for other countries. It offers hope to end this perpetual revolution. And the hope that it offers is by restoring the healthy parts of the national traditions that we can still identify, we can still embrace, we can still give them honor. It's not too late, it's still possible. We can win this fight.